We've got a fair few stand-ups on joining us today. Is mm. there any top tips for combating that? The killer loneliness is lonely life on the road. I need to, have you, how, how do you com combat it? Um, I try and pick my cities very carefully. For example, this week, you know, on this tour that I'm on now, uh, I've got Leeds, Salford, Liverpool, uh, Nottingham, but I just stay in Manchester because that's where so many of my friends are, you know, like from working up here on shoots for the past four years, I've made so many great friends for life in Manchester. So, you know, why am I going to stay in Leeds where I literally don't know a single person? You know, that means after the gig, it's going to be like wandering the streets and then like sat in the hotel room and then like with your body like riveted by adrenaline. It's <laughs> such a sort of weird and dangerous emotional combination. Whereas Manchester tonight, like I'll finish the gig, I'll go and see friends that I haven't seen for months and we'll have a good time, we'll do it up and we'll catch up and I can burn off all that adrenaline, go to sleep happy and, and start, start again tomorrow. I think that's one of the key things, key elements of how to be happy in stand-up. I mean, Jim's got a beautiful situation in that he, he can share his success with his friends, you know, with the, the, his fellow professionals being in a sketch group. And I was always envious of sketch groups coming up, not um, for the money, because <laughs> they, they, they have to split like 20 quid four ways. But um, I can sack them off, I am doing. <laughs> <laughs> but um, just that thing of like, even when you die, it must be like a little bit better because you're just like, the there's thing. someone here who knows exactly how I feel. Even in stand up, when you die, stand up knows how you feel, the other stand up on the bill, but he doesn't care. He doesn't care because he did well. He didn't die like you. So he knows how you feel, but you can't get the right level of empathy from them. Whereas, you know, if, you, if you're on the road with people and you're doing the show together, it's, I think it's, it's a beautiful thing. Um, so yeah, I'd say the main focus when you're out there doing whatever you're doing, a one-person show or anything that's just you on your own as a performer, remember that what you're doing is, is beyond work. We, I know we like to say it's just a job, it isn't, and the reason is because we actually put a bit of ourselves into our work, which is very emotionally draining. Never underestimate how much a performance takes out of you and how much people drain you, like people drain you, that sounds negative, but even an audience laughing for an hour and loving you is, is a, it's a, it's a form of drain, you know, and you can be left feeling empty and spent after that, and you can have a real come down in the same way that you would from a, from a drug, you know, um, so it's about having strategies in place to deal with those things, there's no coincidence that the number of, uh, clinical depressive characters or uh, people suffering from suicidal thoughts or worse is completely out of whack within the um, entertainment industry uh, as it is in, in real life. You know, the, the relativity wise, you know, it, it doesn't make sense. There's no coincidence that there's way more within our industry than there is within the, the wider world of what I would call civilians non-performance, those guys. So be careful. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to go to a question from another guy that unfortunately couldn't make it but was on the bill, the wrong term. But this is from Ben Brown, another Ben, from Bradford, all of these. And he wants to know how you go about planning an hour-long show. Do you have a concept and work towards making your material to fit into that concept? Or do you have loads of ideas which you try and weave together? Mm. I don't think there's a hard or fast rule with that. Um, I think the key thing is to never say anything that you don't care about. I mean, that, that's the most important thing. How you put it together is totally up to you. I think it, 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 there might be someone who tells you this is the way to do it, this is the way to do it, but that just works for them. Like Doing an hour of comedy is a terrifying thing because of the the danger of dying in the middle of it. Like if, if I die within a 10 minute bit, it's fine, I'm gone in 10 minutes, who cares? If you die in the middle of an hour, wow, I mean, that's a long time to, to, to suffer um, for. And uh, I think the key thing is just how whatever makes you the most confident, that's how you go about 
putting the material together. So if that is all your best bits from the year that you've been on the circuit, then fair enough, you know. I mean, in certain more arty arenas or more highly critical arenas like, say, Edinburgh, the Edinburgh Festival, they're going to want to see a beginning and a middle and end to an hour of comedy. So, like, I remember I one very funny friend who went up with just all his best jokes, and the reviews were so sniffy. They were like, yeah, it's just, just an hour of, like, really funny gags. Just, like, they're really funny and everything, but it's just an hour of funny jokes. And, like, yeah, isn't that what the comedy is supposed to be? Like, who, who's the one that suddenly said, oh, and then on 45 minutes you've got to tell a story about your mum having cancer or something like that, you know? I don't really buy into that. I think comedy is comedy is just that. It is comedy. You, not knowing why, not knowing why you're laughing is kind of the beauty of it. And I'm always amazed when I speak to comics who are, you know, they might be like really political or really deep or you know, really. I don't know. They might have, just got. A, there's a real like worth and a real like weight to what they do, and then you ask who their favorite comics are, and it's like the stupidest comics, you know. It often works that way. You, you know, you can't explain what makes you laugh, and therefore it shouldn't be overanalyzed. So I guess in short, in answer to Ben, it's like whatever you think is the silliest, funniest things, put them together, and the structure will follow you. It's a bit like making a mixtape. You know, you used to make mixtapes for girls that you fancied. I don't know if girls, you guys did that for boys when you were younger, but I did it. I used to always like start off with a bang and then like just have like high energy songs for the first like seven or eight. And then like the songs would get a little bit more meaningful. And then like towards the end, it was very much like the metaphor was getting thinner and thinner. It's just like, I really, really want to sleep with you. You should know that by these last three songs, you know? And then the last song is just that one, you know, that's just going to send, send her to bed happy kind of thing, you know? And I, I approach my shows in exactly the same way. Start with a big bang, keep it interesting, keep it energetic. And then when I know I've got them on that half an hour point, I can just do something really silly or just go off book and just have a chat with them because I know that I'm coming back with something highly emotive in in the final act, you know. That's that's good structure. It's basic, but it works. Cool. How are you doing time? I think I've got to go. Okay. But, you know, you know, I wasn't doing the round short questions, questions. We, can, we can have a short round and I'll just try and be brief. Can you? You should do it. Very good questions. All right, they are good questions. questions. Yeah, short questions. Good. Okay. Cool. Right, we'll have one more, one more quick round. One more quick round. About 20 minutes. 20 minutes, right. We'll do that. Adriel, do you want to ask your question number two? Because I think it does link in quite well with what the other things that Doc does. Uh, this is the... Uh, Actually, no, um, maybe, maybe... Maybe... How about question four? Yeah, I, yeah. Question. Yeah, I, was just, I was wondering, uh, I used to go and see you rap back in the day, uh, and uh, I was wondering if there was any negative uh, reaction from the rap community when you started doing stand-up. Yeah, there was when I started, definitely when I started, because people, if you come from a street culture, people are very, very conscious of being serious about that culture, you know, and I think the, all the criticism that I got it almost invariably it came from people who'd never seen me. They'd never seen me do stand-up. So was, all they assumed was, oh, he's taking the piss out of rap. Whereas if you come to see it, I'm not just not taking the piss out of rap. I'm elevating rap. I'm showing you what you can do with a little bit of intelligence. Like, if anything, my stuff celebrates rap, but it celebrates the best of rap, you know? So I shrugged off a lot of that stuff. But it comes back every now and again, you know, people have got crap to say about you, you know, this, that, and the third, and Doc sold out, and blah, blah, blah. That's why when, like, Jamal Edwards from SPTV called me, and he was like, do you want to say anything about any of this stuff? Like, I think you should do it as a rap. So I did. I did a little 64 bars for, for SPTV, and I just basically just said everything I wanted to say. It's probably a better answer to your question, that rap. You should look it up. Cool. Next. Next. Daniel, do you have any more questions for... 
Mr. Brown. Mike, 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 Mike. There we go. There's it. There we go. That's better. Um, yeah, the other question I got is um, kind of, do you have an example of kind of a successful working model for a spoken word showcase? I mean, you've mentioned, uh, what was it, Book Slam before. Yeah. And then Bang said the gun is also a great one in London. But mm. are there any other kind of particular kind of models of spoken word you can suggest? I would have to say I, I don't know. It's, it's, not, it's not an arena that I, I, I'm reg regularly in. I mean, I've got friends of friends. I can think of one off the top of my head. She's involved in some of the best slams in London. I don't know the names of any of them. It's something I could find out, but I would never try and pretend that I was an expert in that field. I love watching it, but I, I tend to stumble across it. You know? Sure. Yeah. Super. Thanks, Daniel. Um, you've got another. You've got another question there um, about the industry, the comedy industry. Yeah, mine was just about networking and mm. meeting people because I don't really like making insincere connections and like non-genuine mm. like conversations with people, which is difficult when you're trying to network. It is difficult, and I think you need to be instinctive. You need to really follow your gut, you know, because there is a lot of insincerity and there's a lot of leeches. That's the main thing. I mean, I feed a number of people like my team is huge in terms of the lawyers the representatives the accountants the promoters everybody eats off me you know they make a lot of money off of me I have to give a huge part of my 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 money to these guys that just do a, a, a you know they do these little jobs for me and whatnot mm. but I don't resent it because I cherry picked every one of them I trust every one of them. They were all genuine with me, uh, and you know we we we've become working partners along the way. However, when you're starting out, you just don't know. You just don't know who to who to go with. Like the shark, there's so many sharks and so many people that want to steal your ideas without even crediting you. But you've got to take a risk. You've got to take the plunge, and you've got to be good in a room. And some people might call that being insincere. I don't. I see it as I want to be in this industry forever. So I can't be like, oh, screw you, you're from Warner and I heard Warner like a really untrustworthy. No, you've got to take every person on, uh, you know, a new terms, new terms of, 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 of face basis, you know, like that. that you, you just met someone anywhere in life. You just ask yourself in your gut, is this person for real or not? And you've got to be positive. The amount of artists that I know that are just, oh yeah, screw that, screw this, screw that channel, screw this company, screw them, they're all like, they're, 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 they're like, um, you know, like, like I said, leeches or they're, they're, they're sharks or they're cheats or whatever. They can't all be because there's loads of artists doing really well on, on loads of, loads of the, the companies, in loads of the companies that, that are mentioned. So I think you've got to start pos positive and you've got to let yourself be proved wrong. Be disappointed by people, but don't go in with a kind of, oh, I don't really want to do this. It's a bit slimy. It's a bit brown nosy. No, man. I'll, I'll, I'll go to all of those parties if I feel like there might be a connection to be made. Because for every nine dickheads, there's there's one genuine person who just loves their job and loves discovering new talent. And if you if you're not willing to play the game, you'll never meet that person. You know. Yeah. I think networking is, is actually it's a it's a big deal. I've 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 made a year's salary in the past from having a a, a glass of wine with the right person. It's not even a joke. You know, so it can happen, but you've got to put yourself out there, you've got to be there first and foremost for that to happen. People work with who they like, you know, they work with who they get on with. If if you're going to be standoffish or difficult, why the hell would anyone want to work with you? You know, a lot of people work with me because it's fun to work with me. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like a lot, of, I get a lot of actors bitching about their agents. You know, sometimes the same agent as as me. And I say, yeah, but you just sit around waiting for them to call you. That's all you do. You know, I'm constantly organizing things off my own back, make, having my own parties, doing my own thing. 
fun stuff with fun people and my agents want to be involved, you know, they want to come along, like, oh yeah, did you go to Doc's thing the other day, I'm definitely going, you know, like I'm that guy and you just kind of got to make yourself that guy, it's, it's part of the game, I, I know what you're saying in that it's a little bit like, mm, it's a bit icky, but it is a, it's a huge part of the game. Yeah, okay, thanks. Wonderful, Erin, and Erin, sorry, uh, Melanie, we'll have another quick one from you, your question. Oh, yes, yes. I just wanted to know what you think about, like, comedy courses. I did one earlier this year. Mm. Um, what do you think about them? I don't buy them. I don't, I don't really get it, you know. Yeah. I just I just think you're either funny or you're not. Like, how do you learn to be funny? Like, I just, I've really never understood comedy courses. That said, I think, like, Im improv courses are, uh, have some worth because that sort of goes beyond comedy. So it's almost like a psychological thing. How do you open your mind up to creating on the spot? That is a skill, I think, that everybody has, but mm -hmm. not everybody knows how to unlock, to turn it on and off like a tap. Mm -hmm. and I think that's good. But like going into some school where mm -hmm. some guy who I've never heard of. Not I know, it's weird because like for no. years I used to look at him. You know? Now, this, weird. I used to look at them and then I did one, but it, like you say, it doesn't make you funny, either funny or not, I believe that, but it gave me the confidence though, to get out there and do it, I don't know how, but it gave me the confidence. Listen, each to their own, man, I think if you got something positive from it, then it's definitely a positive thing for you, but I think for me, it's like the only school is the stuff, like, that's, that's the real, that's the real school, man, like, mm -hmm. your playtime is over, you just get up on stage and you you have to die, you have to experience everything in those early months and that is the greatest college there is, you know. Personally. Okay, thank you. I suppose it's like having on the job experience in any, yeah. any sort of profession, if yeah. you're like university or something. Yeah. yeah. David, do you have a, another question to ask for? Ooh. Hi. Sorry, I was pressing the wrong button there. Uh, yeah, um, Doc. Um, what's your thoughts on the current state of UK comedy and ca have you got any any thoughts on how it's going to progress in the future? It's maybe a bit of a vague question but... Hmm. No, it's a good question. I, I, I think it's, in some ways, it's in the best position it's ever been in in that we've got so much talent. I mean, we've got more talent easily than we've ever had before and, 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 and comics are coming out of the woodwork every day and I, every time I, I, I poke my, my head in on the circuit, there's like a whole new wave of kids that are there that I've not, I've not seen before and they're, they're there, they're confident, they're doing their thing. On top of that, at the highest level of, of entertainment, for the first time our comics, and particularly our comic actors, are progressing to, to Hollywood and, and holding down very respectable careers in, in, in LA, you know, and, and, and in New York, you know, and I think of... Um, an old friend of mine, Ed Weeks, who used to be in a sketch group called Tommy and the Weeks, and you know he's he's out there now. And um, what's that sit sitcom called? Mindy, something like that. Mandy, Mindy, some something like that. Huge show, anyway, in the states. You know, and he's doing his thing. And I think about Richard Ayoade, you know, who I, I did one of my kids' shows with, and you know he he's out there making movies. Russell Brand, Ricky, you know, we we're, we're creating talent that works worldwide now and um, I think the internet's played a, a part in that you know in, in, in narrowing the uh, the borders so to speak and making the world a smaller place um, but also we've just grown in confidence we're not as British about it as we used to be with it ballsy enough and I think it's, it's heading towards a good place I think the thing that's letting it down at the moment uh, the networks here I think the, the networks are very small minded I think everything got to be like a comedy black or uh, uh, a comedy feed on the BBC, a comedy black on Channel 4. No one's really taking the plunge and going, this is really different. Let's just stick a full length pilot on TV at a good time and see what people think. No one's, win no one's willing to take that plunge, which is, I think, a bit of a shame. Um, but, you know. We just have to keep grafting, don't we? And, and what we've really proved, again, to name drop that show that I was telling Jim about, um, High Maintenance, the dude was just like getting no love from the network, so he just put the show out himself on Vimeo. 
now it's like millions of dollars uh, bidding war to try and get the show on, onto television. So I think we have the strength, we have the power as artists in a way that we never had before, which I think is a very positive thing. Um, however, it means there's just a lot more shit. There's just a lot of shit. So you've got to wade through like mountains of shit to get to the good stuff. But funny is funny. We know what's funny, don't we? You know, can't be. You, you can't. People can't bullshit you about what's funny. You can't show me. Yeah, a, a, it's just an instant reaction. You laugh when you don't. Hilarious. No, it's not, bro. Because I didn't laugh once. You're you're wrong. You're wrong. You know. Stop showing me stuff. You're always bumming me out with the videos you choose. You know. So I think funny's funny, and the cream will rise. You know. Cool. We're gonna finish on. Thanks, Doc. Thank you, David, for that second question. Oh, and your, show is, your show is funny. Your show is in that category, David. I really enjoy it. Oh, thank it. you. Yeah. Next, we're going to finish off with uh, Jim from Games Family Gift Shop with a last question from your good, your good self, sir. Hiya. Right. Uh, doing doing stand-up, I've been on a lot of car journeys, car shows with loads of other comics, and uh, one question that always gets asked, which I'm sure you've probably been asked yourself, is uh, what would your ideal stand-up be? Uh, stand-up bill be? Uh, you can pick any comics, living or dead. You've got mm -hmm. to have an, uh, a comper, open, middle, and closing act. Which acts would you choose? I'm glad that's the question. I thought you were going to say we've all been in cars with loads of comics. Who do you really hate? <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll do that on a private hangout afterwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll have a private hangout. I've got a notepad full of them, mate. Um, <laughs> how many am I allowed on the bill? Four altogether, uh, a compa and then three acts. Nice, nice. Okay, yeah. Compare wise, mm. oh god, there's so many great, great hosts. <laughs> I think it'd be a toss up between, and these, this is this is two like opposite ends of the spectrum. I think the compare would be a toss up between Alan Cochran and Cedric the Entertainer. So they, they, those two, in completely different ways, are yeah. two of the best hosts I've ever seen. Like, totally unflappable. That's the thing that they've got in common. But their comedy is it couldn't be more different. Cedric is like, you know, this squat little black guy. I think he's from Chicago. You know, he does loads of voices. He's really good, like acting, uh, acts out stuff. Very lots of sort of physical jokes. Where Alan Cochran does not move, you can hardly see his mouth. Oh, yeah. He never blinks. I don't think he never raises his voice. <laughs> and I've never seen anyone as louche, as sort of quiet and um, calm as him. Like just totally hold down hosting a show. You always think, oh, get the energetic guy. But yeah, Alan's just so well, doesn't he? He's like a boss. He's just like he's like a prime minister. He just he just oozes authority. So it'd be one of them two. And then on the, on the bill, I think I'd probably open with Bill Burr um, because he's got that mix of, he's outrageous, he's got crazy energy, and he's just really, he's really angry. <laughs> he's just really angry. I think like, if he comes out first, it just like it would just lift the room. Do you know what I mean? Uh, I've seen the uh, the YouTube clip of him just screaming at an audience for uh, <laughs> like five minutes. <clears throat> Every comic died, so he went out and insulted them for ten minutes, and then they gave him a stand innovation. He kills me. I mean, he absolutely kills me. <laughs> um, and then in the middle, the middle's the easiest spot. So because yeah. the room's already set, so you could maybe pick a lesser comic, perhaps to to fill that hole, but I'd want to see someone as good, if not better, than, than Bill Burr, so... It could be anyone, living or dead. I, I think Daniel Kitson. I'd go for Daniel Kitson, because he he comes right out of left field, and if the room was set, I think people would still go with him. I think he'd be able to, uh, to win over anybody that was like, what, who the hell is this guy? We just have Bill Burr. And the Dan would be like, I see who the hell I am. <laughs> I'm Daniel Kidd. <laughs> Deal with yeah. it. You know? And I always love watching him. And then I think I'd close. To close, it would be a, a toss-up between Chappelle and Pryor, I think. 
I'd probably have to be prior just because he, there is no way I could ever watch him. So if it's living or yeah. death, I would just absolutely I'd give my right arm to watch prior in front of me. Um, that would be incredible. Uh, and Chappelle would be on, on standby, I guess. Cool. Both great reacts. Good choices. Good question. <laughs> that's my dear is that's, that's it. So let's say a big thank you to Jim. Thanks, from Jim. 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 Thanks, Jim. Thanks for hanging around. Daniel. Thanks, Daniel. Nice one, Daniel. Uh, cheers David. Amy. Cheers, David. Thanks, thanks David. Thanks. Uh, thanks to Adriel from London. Cheers, Adriel. Uh, Erin, thanks from Southampton, but currently in the US of A. Thanks, Erin. Take care. Melanie Gale, and also the phone break that make it. Thank you. And also, Zyra for organising all this. Yeah, She's been amazing. Hold on, Zyra. Fantastic. And thank you very much. Actually, sorry, I forgot to thank the main man himself. Outrageous. Thanks, Doug. Cheers, Doug. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Doug. See ya. Bye. See you, mate. Ciao.